Science is real from the Big Bang to DNA. Welcome back. You see I'm standing next to a list of reactions. We already know that there are many ways different chemicals can react with each other. Fortunately for us, most of those reactions fall under the umbrella of three different types. Precipitation, acid base, oxidation reduction, or redox. Notice these reaction classifications include the reactions you studied in previous classes. Those classifications haven't gone away. We just have more general terms that let us include more reactions. For now, we will focus on precipitation reactions. Here you see Andy in his lab coat and goggles and ready to do some science. He has a clear colorless solution and a transparent yellow solution. When he adds some of the yellow solution to the clear solution, you would expect to see very little. But in fact, you see yellow crystals form, a precipitate. Let's watch it in slow motion. Wasn't that awesome? You don't have to tell me. It's part of what makes chemistry magical. Of course, we know there's an explanation for what just happened. Let's examine what that is. The colorless solution was a solution of barium nitrate. The yellow transparent solution was a solution of potassium chromate. After mixing them, we ended up with an insoluble solid that is bright yellow. So, what is the precipitate? How much did we make? And what was left over hanging out in the solution? These are going to be the questions we are going to be asking ourselves about all our precipitation reactions. We should probably start with, what is the precipitate? Well, what is a precipitate? A precipitate is an insoluble solid that results from mixing solutions. We know of many insoluble solids. Go grab a rock from outside, and put it in a cup of water. Does it dissolve in the water? Probably not. It is insoluble. Well, at least most of it is. Obviously, barium nitrate and potassium chromate are soluble compounds. When we look at the solutions, they are transparent, homogeneous solutions. No leftover crystals to be seen. We also know that when we think about what is actually in those beakers, we want to think of the individual cations and anions floating around all those water molecules. Something happens when I mix the ions from one of those solutions with the ions from the other. There's a strong enough attraction between the ions that even all those pesky water molecules can't keep them apart. They form an insoluble solid, a precipitate. Well, that's great, but how are you supposed to know which ones have an attraction for each other? Oh, that's easy. You just have to memorize the rules. Group 1 ionic compounds and ammonium compounds are soluble. Group 1, of course, being the alkali metals, the first column on the periodic table. Rule number 2. Nitrate, chlorates, and acetate salts are going to be soluble. So, lead to nitrate, Soluble. Gold 3 chlorate. Soluble. Rule number 3. Most chloride, bromide, and iodide salts are soluble, with the exceptions worth noting being silver, lead, and mercury ions. Notice I didn't include fluorides. That little electronegative guy can be quite crabby when it comes to ions. Rule number 4. Most sulfate salts are soluble, except calcium, strontium, barium, silver, mercury, 
and lead sulfates. Hydroxides are insoluble, except calcium, strontium, and barium hydroxides, which are slightly soluble. Some former students like to say Serbaka to remember that. It's like Chewbacca from Star Wars, only after he's been knighted. Serbaka. And rule six. Sulfides, carbonates, chromates, oxides, silicates, and phosphates are insoluble. Sulfide has some exceptions that include magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, or basically the alkaline earth metals. Oh, and don't forget, rule one still applies. See, six simple rules. But just in case it isn't quite so clear, there is a song. Potassium, sodium, and ammonium salts, whatever they may be, can always be depended on for solubility. When asked about the nitrates, the answer is always clear. They each and all are soluble, is all we want to hear. Most every chloride soluble, at least we've always read. Save silver, mercury, smercury, and slightly chloride of lead. Every single sulfate is soluble to set. Set barium and strontium and calcium and lead. Hydroxides and metals won't dissolve, that is all but three. Potassium, sodium, and ammonium dissolve quite readily. And then you must remember that you must not forget. Calcium, barium, strontium dissolve a little bit. The carbonates are insoluble, it's lucky that it's so. Or else our marble buildings would melt away like snow. Potassium, sodium, and ammonium salts, whatever they may be, can always be depended on for solubility. Looking at the ions we have in solution and applying our solubility rules, we discover that the precipitate we formed is barium chromate, since chromates are generally insoluble, while anything coupled with nitrates are going to be totally soluble. All the barium and chromate ions will favor coming together and can no longer be written as separate ions on the product side. We know that soluble ionic compounds dissociate in solution, so Writing potassium nitrate in solution will look like this. Looking carefully at this equation, it is apparent that the potassium and nitrate ions do nothing in this reaction. They are still present, but they are just floating around, just like all the water molecules that we ignore. These ions have a special name, spectator ions, because they just watch the reaction happen like spectators watching the game. They are present before and after the reaction unchanged. Well, if that's the case, why not get rid of them? Okay, let's do it. The end result is called the net ionic equation, or NIE for short. This is the heart of the chemistry that is happening in our demonstration. When discussing reactions, the net ionic equation is the point. Now, I actually just discussed three ways to write a reaction. The molecular equation is your typical chemical equation, maintaining the molecules as a whole in the equation. The complete ionic equation is a more complete description of what is actually happening in the solution by keeping our aqueous ions separate as they truly exist in the solutions we are using. The net ionic equation is the meat and potatoes of what is happening in the reaction without any extraneous distractions. Well, which do you use? Depends on what's being asked of you. For now, we're going to focus on developing our skills for writing net ionic equations. I mean, you've been writing molecular equations since you were just a baby chemist. We're going to focus our efforts in class on developing our new skill set, specifically using our solubility rules to identify our precipitates, writing the net ionic equations, and applying our knowledge of stoichiometry and solutions to solving problems about those reactions. 
Let's go ahead and try writing the equation for one more reaction, just to reinforce our major ideas when dealing with precipitation reactions. We will write the three reaction types, molecular equations, complete ionic equation, and net ionic equation for a precipitation reaction. Also, we will identify the spectator ions in the solution. Imagine solutions of sodium chloride and lead to nitrate. They are both clear, colorless solutions. Though we write the reaction side of the equation like this, we know that AQ symbol really means the species in solution are actually in the form of this. We've already written out half of the molecular equation and half of the complete ionic equation just by thinking about the chemistry of the two solutions. Now we have to actually consider what happens when those ions come in contact with each other. In other words, will any precipitates form? Matching the cations with the anions, we consider our solubility rules. Immediately I recall that sodium and nitrate compounds are going to be soluble. What about lead 2 chloride? Though most chlorides are soluble, lead 2 is one of the exceptions along with mercury too and silver. Folks, we found our precipitate. Let's go ahead and see what it looks like. Ooh, ah, a white crystalline structure. Actually, most chlorides look like a white crystalline. Think of sodium chloride, in fact, most precipitation reactions in general yield something that looks like this. But it's still pretty cool. Now that we have our overall product, we can finish writing our equations. Lead 2 chloride will be our solid, with sodium nitrate as our leftovers. So the molecular equation will look like this. As for a complete ionic equation, it will look like this. Notice that the lead to chloride remains together as a solid. Its ions are no longer floating around in solution. Its attractive forces formed an organized ionic solid. That just leaves us with the net ionic equation. It's pretty simple. Which species did something? The things used to make the lead to chloride, of course. Lead 2 plus 2 chlorides yields lead 2 chloride precipitate. So, what were our spectator ions? Looking back at the complete ionic equation, I see that the sodium and nitrate ions do not change from the reactant side to the product side. They are just watching the action happen as they go for a swim. They are the spectator ions. Bravo! Now you're experts on precipitation reactions. Sure. You've got some solubility rules to memorize. And we do need to think about how we're going to connect this new way of thinking about reaction equations with our stoichiometry. But that just requires a little practice, a little problem solving on your part. To give you a head start, let's consider our lead 2 chloride precipitate. If I had 50.0 milliliters of a 0.875 molar solution of sodium chloride, and 50.0 milliliters of a 0 0.560 molar solution of lead to nitrate, what mass of precipitate should I measure out after I filter and dry it? Go ahead and get started on that problem while this precipitation stuff is fresh in your mind. We will discuss this problem and do some more practice when we get back to class. Good luck. Science is real.